I see Bitcoin going up 100x over the next decade. There's been about 15 billion, roughly, in inflows into these ETFs in the first six months. If you look at the most successful launches of ETFs ever, number one is BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF, and number two is Fidelity's Bitcoin ETF. And that's like all ETFs ever. Once it's been traded for 90 days, advisors start to have enough of a history that they can come to their clients and they can say, you know, I've got this brilliant idea about this investment for you. and I'm it's this IBIT. Bitcoin has got this 15 year history, but these products don't. And you have to understand about who these products are for. As soon as Bitcoin becomes normalized, it'd be 1% of the portfolio. That would be enough to really drop a massive bull market. Bitcoin doesn't need Michael Saylor. Like Bitcoin is happening with or without Michael Saylor. It just so happens that, you know, it's, it's great when you have very smart, intelligent, articulate people explaining the ideas. It was better to buy 10 years ago than today, and better to buy today than in 10 years time. Eventually we'll see the first country to print money to buy Bitcoin. That's going to be a big deal when that happens. And the first one to do that, they're going to really benefit. And you're tracking the, the Bitcoin ETF really closely. I'm unfortunately not. Uh, like I should do a better job in <laughs> tracking the Bitcoin ETF. Uh, and you're doing a, a lot of uh, things with, with charts. I also saw that uh, I think the inflow tracker or flow tracker on, on your website or some, some, something like that. Uh, it was really cool to see. Um, first of all, like, like, why are you doing that? Like, what, what's the significance maybe of, of, of the ETF and why are you putting so many uh, charts and analysis about that out? Yeah, sure. Look, I mean, we're tracking the, tracking the, these Bitcoin ETF flows because I would say that really the US ETFs, um, it's, it's the biggest story in Bitcoin 2024, and I would say going forward. And what I mean by that is not just any one particular ETF, but it's really this kind of story of um, Bitcoin embedding itself into the traditional financial system. And this is really the major way in which adoption is going to happen for uh, certainly the majority of the capital going forward, if not necessarily people, you know, vast, vast majority of the actual capital that is going to flow into Bitcoin is going to come through, I believe, uh, through this mechanism because it's the best and easiest way for kind of institutions to adopt Bitcoin, essentially. Yeah, and for me, it's also like when, when you have the, um, the biggest changes, like there are a lot of really uh, like older people that have a lot of money that have family businesses and, and they don't want to have self custody maybe. And they just want to pick up the phone and say, Hey, I want to have 20 million in Bitcoin. And I think those are the, the adoption curves that is like Bitcoin kind of grew up with the Bitcoin ETF uh, as I, as I see it. Um, but the one thing that I always get asked when I make anything about Bitcoin ETF, why did the price not rise enough, <laughs> like not, not, not as, as much as many expected. I mean, the, the expectation was really high. I think Samson Mao put something up with like a million price target in within weeks when the Bitcoin ETF gets launched, sure. something like that, that are, there, there were some crazy price targets out there. Um, were you disappointed with the, with the launch of the ETF? No, I, I, I haven't been disappointed. Um, I mean, I, I think that when you look at kind of like million price targets or any of this kind of stuff, I mean, look, I don't want to speak for Samson, but I would estimate when I, when I, when I see someone like Samson put out a million dollar price target on, on, on Bitcoin, I don't read that as going Bitcoin is like, that's not how I read it. I just, like, I don't read it as Bitcoin is going a million. I read it as I'm really bullish on Bitcoin. That's what I think Samson is saying. I think that, um, you know, if, if people are taking that stuff literally, they're going to be disappointed. But that's not, you know, that's not how Twitter really works. Like, I don't, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, suggest anyone take that kind of stuff literally. But what I would say is the ETFs, like, like they have been extremely bullish for Bitcoin and are extremely bullish for Bitcoin and when you look at the, what most people have perceived for in terms of the actual inflows into these ETFs, I think they've just far outshone most people's expectations. Now, you did have Standard Chartered come out and they predicted about $100 billion in Bitcoin uh, inflows over the first 12 months, but they were by far the outlier. Most sort of pundits, analysts actually 
had no expectations of these flows anywhere close to what we've seen. And, you know, if you look at the most successful launches of ETFs ever, number one is BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF. And number two is Fidelity's Bitcoin ETF. And that's like all ETFs ever. So I don't think anyone could be reasonably disappointed at seeing that, yeah, look, there's been about 15 billion roughly in inflows into these ETFs in the first six months. And especially when you consider that this isn't, you know, it's not a, like a binary on off switch realistically, like there's actually a process here or, or a set of kind of checkpoints and dominoes that needs to fall in order for the flows to really get going into these ETFs because it's, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be put in place. You need to have wirehouses offer these ETFs. You need to have brokers offer them. They're not, they, they need to be available on platforms. So, and that, that's happening like slowly over time. A lot of people still don't have access to these ETFs. And then also when you consider that the, the expectation, the reasonable expectation is that you know, each one of these things is a new security effectively. And for a financial advisor to offer it to their clients, it needs some kind of trading history. So it's actually extremely common that you would expect, yeah, you know, wait for it to trade. I mean, there's a kind of a 90 day trading rule that typically happens with these things where once it's been traded for 90 days, advisors start to have enough of a history that they can come to their clients and they can say, you know, I've got this brilliant idea about this investment for you. And it's this IBIT, you know, because Bitcoin has got this 15 year history, but these products don't. And you have to understand about who these products are for. It's for kind of traditional financial advisors and, and this sort of thing. These are the kind of new players that are coming in to invest in, invest in Bitcoin. It's not for, for, you know, the majority of kind of traditional retail or whatever, they can just, they, you know, Coinbase was around last year too. So we, we didn't, didn't need these ETFs. It's for a new class of investors. And for these, this class of investors, you would expect that it takes time. It's like, hey, I'll invest when, you know, my, my brokerage allows it to happen. And it just isn't available for, and it, and it won't be available all at once. It happens over time. So look, you know, when I look at that and I go, okay, 15 billion in flows in six months, it's a good start. It's a good start. Do you think that the the biggest thing is still to come? Because I feel like uh, we have been in the ATF, I think half a year now, something like that. So like uh, almost six months we are now in there. Uh, and I get the argument that like a lot of thing takes time. Like you, you, like it's, 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 it's usually not like one person saying like, Oh yeah, let's, let's buy something. There's like a board, there's family businesses. And even that one person needs time to, to get used to it and educated on it. Uh, so I, I get that it takes time. Do you think that the, 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 the major adoption of a Bitcoin ETF uh, will come in like the next few years? And this is just like a small beginning, the laying the groundworks of it. That would be, that would be my assumption. And I think that's what a lot of people actually expected going in. Um, I think the, probably the easiest an analogy or the sort of comparison is look, just looking at the gold ETFs from 20 years ago, you know, the uh, GLD opened up, but the flows weren't really there in the first few months. Actually, if you look at it historically, you, you look at it after five years and it, gee, it had these massive inflows into GLD and it led a, an enormous bull market for gold, but it didn't happen overnight. Um, so I don't necessarily think we should expect anything different for Bitcoin, really. It's for me fascinating. We always have those stories in Bitcoin, like when 2020 was this, the first publicly traded company with MicroStrategy, with 2021 was really dominated by El Salvador, uh, basically, and now it's like the, the Bitcoin ETF time. But when I look at everything, it's, it's kind of, what's, what's the next story? I feel like the next story is just everything that we worked now, uh, all the groundwork, all the uh, buckets that we have to fill, they are now all a little bit filled from like 1% maybe, and then we are filling all the buckets up. Or do you see any, any, any next story uh, f uh, after the ETF, anything that you look at like, oh, we, we need that to actually come to those uh, price targets of a million or 3 million or 5 million? 
Yeah, look, I, I would say that the biggest thing is normalizing Bitcoin as an allocation within an investment portfolio. So a, like a really big moment will be when BlackRock puts it in their balance fund and they say, we think as a, as a part of a normal balance portfolio, Bitcoin should be 3% of the portfolio. Not only because that, that in itself will drive um, a significant amount of flows just from BlackRock literally buying Bitcoin to fill up their balance fund, but also because of the signal that sends to the rest of the world that if you're managing a traditional portfolio, you're an institutional manager managing a portfolio, you're a pension fund, or any, frankly, any kind of just 60, 40 balanced uh, portfolio out there that needs to have some some sort of allocation of Bitcoin. And when that becomes normalized, that's when you see these, well, it, I mean, if th that's when you see these massive flows coming into Bitcoin and you think about how many trillions of assets there actually are managed going into these equities and bonds essentially entirely. And you, now you have a new asset class. And as, as soon as Bitcoin becomes normalized, it, it, any, any piece really, it doesn't even... It doesn't, even if it was normalized to be 1% of the portfolio, that would be enough to really drive a massive bull market. And it hasn't happened yet, realistically. We've had some kind of very early adopters. So you've got some pension funds like Wisconsin Pension, the Wisconsin Pension Fund, which has got a, a tiny allocation to Bitcoin. But realistically, you don't have many uh, actual... It, it's, it's, it's a very kind of... Uh, novel position to take to say Bitcoin is appropriate as a part of your balance portfolio, which is not something that we really see right now. And I think we we have to step out a little bit of our Bitcoin Twitter world where <laughs> everyone is bullish and everyone is like, ah, oh, Bitcoin 100%, Bitcoin 80%. Uh, when you step out in the normal world, you see that people don't get Bitcoin, they don't have any Bitcoin, uh, and they don't even know some of the basics, like this this meme with 21 million. Uh, go ahead and ask on a street how many people know what's the significance if, with the number 21 in Bitcoin. I think probably like 95% of 100 people don't know about it. So we are really early on. Um, the, that, that's why I think education is is is, is so so important for for us Bitcoiners. What do you see? Like, is is there anything else that we should do? Like, is education the the number one key, and everything else is kind of kind of falling uh, to that? I will say that, in some sense, I think we're now kind of Bitcoin is, um, you know, th this kind of community of Bitcoin is online have kind of been the vanguard of Bitcoin education. Done an amazing job with like podcasts and YouTube and books and this sort of thing over the past decade. And I think what's what's going to happen over the next decade is we're kind of handing that off to BlackRock and to Fidelity and to these institutions so that they can speak the language of the real the real money to like these this institutional capital to flow in. Because you know the the, the kind of Mimetic ideas that might have convinced you or me are not the same. It's not, it's not the same thing that is needed to find the next sort of unlock the next pools of capital. And that's why, for example, some really imp like some really fundamental ideas that are crucial to the foundation of Bitcoin, like Bitcoin is freedom money. It's 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 an incredibly important meme, and it it it. Is, was very important, say, last cycle in 2020, and, and it still has a kind of a foundation for the, uh, I guess, the kind of the, the Bitcoin maximalists, the people will, that will hold on no matter what. But it's freedom money is not the meme to convince a pension fund to allocate 4% of their, their portfolio to Bitcoin. What will convince them is, Look, look at the diversifying properties of Bitcoin within your portfolio. Look at the expected returns. Look at the sharp ratio. Look how it, it's going to, you know, off, offer just a significant enhancement to, to your portfolio. These are the kind of things that BlackRock, like this is, this is what they do. This is what they're good at in terms of speaking that kind of language to uh, the next kind of larger pools of capital. But the, the kind of... 
the foundational stuff that comes from like Bitcoin, Twitter and this sort of thing, I still think it's really important for convincing like your neighbor to buy Bitcoin. But that's kind of the reason what the where I would dis, sort of dis, differentiate or distinguish the thing is, is that when you're talking to your neighbor about Bitcoin, you're not doing that to help Bitcoin. You're doing that to help your neighbor. <laughs> like, like that's that's not really kind of it doesn't matter to Bitcoin whether your your friend buys Bitcoin or not. they they can't affect the Bitcoin price at this point. It, it's completely irrelevant if you you know your your loved one if you can convince a loved one to buy Bitcoin. It just doesn't make any difference whatsoever to Bitcoin, but it will make a big difference to their lives. And so I still think in that sense education is like you know offering them you know like getting them to listen to your podcast or just or just providing some books or some history and this sort of thing is, is great for, you know, friends, family or the people you want to orange pill along the way. But that's probably not the kind of educational material that's needed to, you know, unlock the serious capital that's going to drive Bitcoin from, you know, sitting at 60K to 500K. That's a, it's just a different, it's just a different, uh, different base, really. Yeah, I also see it like this, this mind shift that I had, like, I think it was a year ago where I went like, oh, like, I don't need to orange pill anyone for Bitcoin, but I still should orange pill people that I love because it's kind of an act of service to them. Like they, they should know about it. They, they benefit from it long term. When I tell them now about it, I cannot force them. Uh, I, I cannot tell them like, do it. Uh, they, They, they will do it if, if they want to, but I should at least make sure that once I told them that I think it's a really good idea and you should look into that. Uh, so it's, it's kind of an, an act of service if you, if you will. So, because yes, you're right. Like even if I convince all my friends to invest in Bitcoin and they put all their money in there, Bitcoin does like that's that's yeah. so, such a small amount of money. Um, uh, it's it's like may, maybe Michael Saylor when he uh, <laughs> orange pills the, the Michael Dells and and, and the other yeah. uh, people that that makes a difference maybe uh, because they come in with a lot of money and they have a lot of very powerful friends. But uh, the normal blabs don't really make a huge difference in the in the price. Long term, it makes a difference in, in the grassroots movement because then more people maybe go to a store and ask, hey, can I pay with Bitcoin? Or more people uh, ask to go to a bank and ask them about Bitcoin. Or they, more people go to politicians and ask them, hey, uh, what's your opinion on Bitcoin? So like from a grassroots movement perspective, um, I think it does make a difference, um, but not really from a price perspective it's more like a, a, a small grassroots uh, movement kind of a thing yeah look I, i i agree with that and also if 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 it kind of relied on i think i think the fact that it doesn't rely on you or i or anyone really orange pilling people is why it works like if it if it that's probably what distinguishes it from some of these other other memes like uh take like a, a kind of a common example today in a different world, but tangential might be like GME, you know, getting people to invest in the GameStop phenomenon. Like that's where you really do need to find the next guy to jump on GME. Like it's really important to spread that GME meme because the, the, the fundamental mathematics of the Like that stock is not going to work unless people, unless you can convince more hordes and hordes and hordes of people to jump on it. With Bitcoin, it's different. It, it, it's, you know, it will affect in some sense, like the rate of obviously price appreciation will change depending on kind of uh, the velocity of the meme and how excited people are about Bitcoin. But there is this kind of fundamentals of 21 million Bitcoin versus infinite fiat money that everything will kind of take care of itself regardless of, um, you know, how convincing, how convincing people are with like their, look, how convincing people are with their, their memes and their, or their, their orange pilling benefits. I mean, take someone like Michael Saylor, who I think has been fantastic for the Bitcoin community in terms of expressing some great ideas about why, why Bitcoin is so important for the world. 
But Bitcoin doesn't need Michael Saylor. Like Bitcoin, Bitcoin is happening with or without Michael Saylor. It just so happens that, you know, it's, it's great when you have very smart, intelligent, articulate people explaining the ideas. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a big thing. Like uh, it's, it's great to have those people on our team. It's great to have them on our team. But at the same time, when you make this experiment, like, okay, what if Michael Saylor was not there? There's still a lot of great people that have a lot of great ideas. And then they're like, oh, maybe maybe like uh there, there will come in the future really good people that like then uh are the big stars on the on the bitcoin conference because right now it's like when you go to bitcoin prague or anything like that michael sale is the uh one of the biggest stars even though also like <laughs> some haters out there but usually like people really like him because their their ideas are really strong what what i thought about now when when i heard what you're saying about gme why, why do you think so many people buy in narratives like GME or meme coins or altcoins. I mean, there are sometimes beautiful stories, but if you look from a rational perspective on those things, you're like, no, I don't invest my life savings in there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, there's, there's probably a macro and a micro. I mean, from people, I mean, you look at a lot of the trends, you see that gambling is massively on the rise uh, in society. And certainly relative to where it was a couple of decades ago. And, you know, historically, this is something that just seems to be really highly correlated with uh, when, the, when, when money is being debased, people start to kind of speculate and gamble more. Uh, this is like, when you read a book like Fiat Money Inflation in France, they, they, they talk about the fiat inflation that happened or the money printing that happened at, at Uh, a couple of hundred years ago in France, and during that period of basically massive debasement of French money, they, you had massive amounts of gambling. And, you, and we've actually seen that in societies across humans for hundreds of years. There are so many different examples of that popping up. And I think what happens is that people, we don't really have any kind of obvious like store of value. So in that world where people have value, but no clear store of value, You tend to go, well, who better gamble it? And especially in a time when we basically have massive uncertainty because you can't, without having, unless you, unless you understand Bitcoin and have really confidence in Bitcoin, then you don't have any reason to have any kind of confidence in the future in general. So everybody has this kind of underlying sensation that they really need to like basically YOLO invest all their stuff to make it big. Because in order to really guarantee your future in the kind of like, and unless, unless like, let's say you didn't have Bitcoin, right? And you, you, you also, you're operating in our existing kind of economic system. You, you're going to feel sort of insecurity about your future. And, you, and the only way to really feel comfortable is I've got to make it really rich. Like if you didn't have Bitcoin, the only, only other way to kind of, get comfortable is going, well, I got to make tens of millions of dollars. That's the only way I'm going to feel like I've got a safe, secure future. It's just, that's how people feel. And, you know, kind of talking across a whole broad range of people, but I just think that people are desperate to make it really big because it's kind of an, ins it's just an economic insecurity that pops up. And then, and then of course, you know, we, we also have this kind of digital age where you get, people get sucked into memes and all this kind of stuff because social media is just like, Oh, when you see, when you see other people doing it, you kind of want to join the bandwagon. So there's kind of multiple effects going on at once, but that's kind of why I think it's happening. How do you think, uh, when we are looking out in the future, Bitcoin is actually established as a store of value, maybe even beyond that. Uh, and it's like everyone kind of agrees that it has value and everyone has this understanding of, 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 of Bitcoin is that safe place to store value. Um, how do you think this will influence a society? Will those, those gamblings, those meme coins, those, uh, those short term thinking actually vanish or is, is Bitcoin in the end of the day, just another asset that does not influence society too much? No, I, I do think it will influence society and, and we both, it's not to say like, there's some fundamental urges that never go away. Right. So I, 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 it's not to say that people won't be gambling and this sort of thing, even in, in a Bitcoin Well, I, I, I 100% think they will. But on the on the margins, when you have people that um, 
if you have kind of economic security and if you're really confident that you're going to have a good, prosperous life for your family, you're going to have say you're going to have a secure home, you're going to have all this kind of prosperity. You're going to feel less urgency to gamble, and I think, and 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 what what that has is it also has a big impact because as you start to feel like less urgent and you do a little bit less gambling yourself, then the people around you, there's less of that mimetic push to push you into gambling because less of your friends are gambling, less of everybody else is gambling. And so it just kind of reduces that impact on society when, you know, as one person is impacted, the rest of us are impacted because we're all kind of, we're so interconnected with each other that, the actions of, you know, you, like your actions, Robin, affect me. When I see you do something, I, it makes me potentially want to do that. That's just how humans operate. So I do think it will have a big impact on the way we operate, for sure. It's interesting. I, I never thought about the impact that Bitcoin has on society because of Bitcoiners uh, being successful. When, when we have now in, in let, let's think of a family that has like, I don't know, 30 people or 20 people in there. And there's this one Bitcoin guy uh, and this one Bitcoin guy all of a sudden does good financially. He all of a sudden cares for his health. Uh, he cares for his nutrition, his uh, his sports uh, and everything like that. Um, it's It's just natural that all the rest of the family members look to him and they're like, oh, what does he do right? Like what, what, what's right with the, they, they kind of um, assume that uh, there might be something and they uh, copy to a certain extent or they get inspired by, by his behavior. I never thought about that uh, thing because they're like this, this influences society on a, on a whole different level because that's, I guess the, like on a big family, if there's a big family, there's a big chance that there's already one Bitcoin in there. <laughs> I've like, when we're talking about 50 people and I, I talked about that on the podcast, I, my family, for example, when I started in Bitcoin, I was the only one that even had Bitcoin. Uh, and then when the years go by and I talk about Bitcoin a lot, uh, my dad got it, my mom got it, my, my sister got it, uh, my cousin got it, my uncle got it. And all of a sudden we're sitting on the the Christmas table and uh, 30, 40% of the uh, family already has Bitcoin. And it's like when then Bitcoin comes up as a topic, uh, it's, it's, it's like a uh, way more snowball effect. It's like then, then the other like, oh, you, you, you all have Bitcoin? Oh, I guess I should also have like some so I don't miss out when the whole family uh, gets wealthy and, and rich and I don't. So like there's, there's a lot of like, adoption and game theory is like really interesting for, for me uh, and to, to see that. How do, you, how do you see that? Like when, when you look at a game theory and, and, and this whole adoption phase, do you have some, some predictions here? Well, I do think that one of the things that uh, some people don't like about Bitcoin, but is objectively true is that because of the nature of it, it, does, it just benefits the people that get in, that buy it first. Like, it was better to buy 10 years ago than today and better to buy today than in 10 years time. And so because of that, that's just like a fundamental nature of Bitcoin because it's deflationary money. It's increasing in value over time. And so because of that kind of game theory, you have a situation in which people are incentivized to be first. MicroStrategy is the first company to take Bitcoin and have this kind of treasury at treasury uh, a strategy with it. And what you see is now there are some kind of other companies kind of aping the strategy or following it and they're going to do well, but they're not going to do as well as MicroStrategy because MicroStrategy was the first one to do it and they did it years earlier and just that's the nature of it. And MicroStrategy were buying at $10,000 a Bitcoin. So you're going to have a situation in the future where like, well, you already have a situation where El Salvador are early adoptees and, th and they're going to benefit from having gotten in earlier. But what happens is, is that when we're going to start to see, eventually we'll see the first country to print money to buy Bitcoin. That's going to be a big deal when that happens. And then the, and the first one to do that, they're going to really benefit. And the second one will still do well and the third one, but... You don't want to be last. 
but you, you just you just don't want to be lost. And that's the kind of the game theory element of if you understand that because by its nature it's deflationary, it's growing in value forever, so it's going to be around in the future. Then it's like, oh, it's better to buy it if as soon as you accept that you're going to be allocating to it in the future, you want to front run it. Actually, that's what you want to do. You, 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 as soon as you accept that I'm going to buy it in ten years' time, I'd rather buy it today than in ten years' time. And, and, and everybody's kind of grappling with that right now, and it does create kind of uh, weird incentives where you know people have this like. Like if, if you're a Bitcoiner, you kind of heavily incentivized to have a very high savings rate right now, and probably much higher than you otherwise would have. But you sort of know that realistically, like it's better for me to save a lot now than in the future because the savings I have now, the purchasing power is much stronger today. Um, and it's actually kind of the opposite game theory incentives of sort of kind of the I guess the classical financial inflation system where everything is incentivizing you to spend, get rid of all your cash, you know, <laughs> but like that's, that's the kind of the system we have right now, like getting as much, getting as much credit card debt as you can, getting as much debt as you can spend more than you really have today, because we won't believe that that spending will be kind of devalued over time. That's, that's what an inflationary system is. But we have the Bitcoin is the opposite in its, by its nature. So it just changes our behavior, our incentives. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video. And I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with. Like 21 Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistic. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And uh, now let's get back to the video. But would not also Bitcoin kind of incentivize to, to get some credits and loans out to buy more Bitcoin now when we know like, oh, fiat will, <laughs> fiat will not be worth anything and I take a loan out for like maybe 20 years time and uh, I take a big bet on, on, on Bitcoin. Uh, I see a lot of Bitcoiners even doing like uh, th those kind of stuff. Yeah, in, in some sense it does. Um, but the, the only thing is that you have to weigh up your kind of like, you know, you, you, you sort of an individual's utility function is not just, it's not just maximized by like the EV of their Bitcoin holdings. You also have to sleep at night. You also have to deal with the, like handle the volatility and the stress of uh, Bitcoin is volatile and it fluctuates. And, you don't, you don't want to be underwater and then have to sell your Bitcoin at a loss. And so that's why, like, in the loans idea, uh, if we were kind of unemotional creatures, like purely mathematical, it, it can be a good strategy. But the problem is, is that if you're going to freak out uh, when, you, when you take out a loan to buy Bitcoin and then and the price drops and then you, you freak out, it doesn't work. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the kind of the problem with that idea, but it can work for certain individuals if they're wired that way. And, you know, they have like the income stream to comfortably pay off their debts and this sort of thing, you know, for an individual, it, it could work, but it's also, um, it's like, it's very specific to the individual, I think. Yeah, I myself, uh, did it, but I kind of. I came to this conclusion, it's um, way more, it, it's better, more relaxed and, and a better way of life when you just have your income and what you do for a living and you're being really good in that, you can just save it in Bitcoin. Because I was 120% in Bitcoin 
now I'm like 104. I'm, I'm fighting my way back to like 90, uh, 95%, something like that. I uh, have some sort of uh, <laughs> a buffer uh, to the 100%, but uh, it, it does not, it does make sense. Like it, it definitely made uh, financial sense for me uh, yeah. to do it and uh, it, 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 it still pays off. Um, but the, like, when we just look at financial side, it's, it's, it's a good thing to do long term, uh, obviously, uh, because Bitcoin performs very good long term. But the, the side that you mentioned, like, you have to sleep at night, you have to deal with that. Uh, there are monthly payments that you have to, to bring in. And when you just have like, um, a savings with Bitcoin and you don't have this monthly payments of, of credits or something like that, um, it's, it's a way better feeling. You, you, you feel way more free. And, and, and this is a feeling that like, it's way more worth than a little bit more money, maybe in five years. <laughs> so like, I think that's, that's, that's my angle now, even though I did it, but now I, I kind of get rid of it. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think that's, I think that's right. Like from a mathematical perspective, being operating at like 115% or whatever, it's probably, that's probably better, but it's not necessarily better for your life. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's actually De how I would say. Definitely. Um, how do you see actually, um, Bitcoin because right now Bitcoin is still seen in the mainstream media as this small speculative asset that might be something or might not be something that's bad for the environment or it's not bad for the environment. There are all these this things out there uh, and it's, it's slowly, slowly progressing and slowly, slowly getting uh, on the adult table of the, of the side, like the, in Christmas, I think um, who made that, uh, Alessandro Ottovani made that comparison, like uh, Bitcoin moved from the kids tables to the adult table now uh, and is, is playing on the, on the big scene now. Um, where do you see like Bitcoin going forward as the, the, what, what is the role of Bitcoin in the financial market in like 10, 20, 50 years? Uh, will it be the base layer of everything or where do you see uh, Bitcoin going? Well, I think it's a, it's foundational store of value. Uh, and, and, and in that sense, it could be, it could easily be without really um, being anything too different to what it is today we might see a world in which Bitcoin is worth 10% of everything. It just, not even if it's like not all that different to today, but just foundational store of value um, in the same way that, you know, realistically that's like, we have a kind of our stock market. We have all these passive flows into, into the, into the, you know, S and P 500. And this isn't really people kind of trying to buy stocks because they happen to like particular companies or want to invest. It's because they have a paycheck and they just take 20% and throw it at a, you know, throw it into a box, a store of value box. And that store of value box has historically been the Vanguard passive, you know, index fund, but actually Bitcoin is just a better invest. It's like a better investment vehicle for that. So I think that one, one sort of potential way this world goes is you just see more and more people use Bitcoin as a savings tool and it kind of fulfills that store of value role. What's, what's kind of really interesting is whether, you know, Bitcoin's potential to become like money, like actually an actual currency that people use. That's really difficult to predict because you're trying to figure out kind of two major trends like systematically you have you have sort of a tech technological you need to have a thesis about whether some kind of layer two for bitcoin is is going to work like a lightning network or potentially um you know maybe bitcoin is just tacked onto the existing fiat system and you have literally just using like visa rails for trading a kind of paper bitcoin essentially but what but you we know that bitcoin sort of has its own like limitations from a sort of base layer perspective that it's not going to be traded as we're not going to be using base layer Bitcoin to be trading, like buying coffees with because it's just fees are too expensive. It just doesn't, doesn't work. So there's you, that, that in itself is like almost impossible to predict. And then of course, we also have a political situation where if, if a government is going to tax you every time you spend it, 
that's going to make things difficult. As soon as it, it go, if, if governments come out and say, we're going to treat it like a currency, not like a property, so you can spend Bitcoin, move Bitcoin around, well, that will, that will immediately start the, you know, trigger the use, catalyze the use of Bitcoin as a currency much more than it is today. So there's like multiple factors going on at once, which I don't, I mean, it's fun to like kind of, you know, shoot the shit over, but it's also like, it's kind of impossible to predict. But I don't think it really matters from our perspective in terms of like, you know, e either way, I see Bitcoin going up 100x over the next decade, you know, or so it, it doesn't really matter. It, well, you, you, you get what I'm getting at, right? Like, yeah. maybe, maybe it's not going to 100x over the next decade, but certainly, a ma like, it's, it's just the investment thesis doesn't really change. It's still massively uh, obvious, asymmetric bet, regardless of the kind of what happens to it as a currency unit, I guess is what, how I would put it. Yeah, and I think the, the massive price appreciation is in the store of value story. When it then also becomes a medium of exchange and, and, and unit of account, this is also great, uh, brings other benefits. But I think like when we have like price appreciation to 100%, let's just have to scale. I think 90% of the price appreciation and going up is because people store the value in there and not exchanging with one another. So I think like the, the biggest run up uh, is is the store of value phases, I guess. And there's a re interesting thing because of taxes. I, for example, would ask in every restaurant if they accept Bitcoin, I would spend my Bitcoin everywhere if there would not be a tax implication. Like if, mm -hmm. if there would not be, uh, like right now in Austria, it's different from every country, there's a 27.5% tax on Bitcoin profits. For example, if I bought Bitcoin, a uh, thousand euros, uh, and then now it's, it's 2000 euros. And with those 2000 euros, I want to buy, I don't know, a small motorcycle. Uh, then I get, I have to pay this 2000 euros for the motorcycle, but additionally I have to pay 270 euros and five euros in, in taxes, which is really not fun <laughs> to sp yeah. spend 200 extra euros just for taxes. So I think uh, just from my personal view, I'm all in Bitcoin. I only have feared because there are no tax implications uh, and maybe because it's short term, not as volatile as, as, as Bitcoin in, 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 in a really short term, uh, uh, site. So I would spend Bitcoin like crazy because I can just spend and replace. Uh, this doesn't matter with a, like a lightning wallet, uh, then there are also the fees are, are not really there. If, if I just use a lightning wallet where there are no fees, um, I, I would love that world and I would love to, to bring Bitcoin adoption and, and awareness to the world. But and if the tax implication is just not practical. Right. Um, and also, you know, where is most of the capital being stored? It's being stored in these kind of endowment, sovereign wealth funds, these sort of things that it's not, it doesn't need, they're not, uh, it's not, it's not for money purpose in terms of the currency purposes. It's, it's sitting there, you know, you have, you have a country that has a hundred billion dollar sovereign wealth fund. They don't need, they don't need like, they're not holding it in currency anyway. They're not, then that hundred billion isn't sitting in us dollars. It's sitting in, invested assets. The reality is most of, even if you don't own Bitcoin, most of people's savings are not in currency anyway. They're sitting in their house or maybe the stock market. So, you know, payments would be great if we, if we can kind of unlock that. And I think that it's, um, you know, like an extremely worthwhile thing for people to pursue. Um, but we'll see, we'll just see how that plays out. It's, it's just really unclear right now. Yeah, I think in the medium term, it's it's more like to, in the medium term, I feel like Bitcoin is more replacing real estate as an investment and uh, replacing ETFs as an investment, especially ETFs. Uh, in, in Austria, people are crazy about real estate and, and ETFs as a an, uh, way of, of storing the value. And it's, it's more like that. Uh, a different question. Um, how do you see when we have... ETFs, when we have Coinbase, when we have all those different players and most people actually have their Bitcoin on exchange uh, or with some third party, 
uh, in Bitcoin Prague, um, the treasure CEO said uh, it's only 2% of Bitcoiners who are actually having their own keys, which was shocking for me that it's that low. I've, I thought it's like more like 10%, but uh, 2% yeah. was, was, was shocking for me. Um, what was what is the future of self custody? Will will everybody um, or like a big percentage of 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 people actually do the self custody, or is like everyone with a Bitcoin bank and and self custody is really only for the outliers? Uh, yeah, I, I suspect it. I suspect it's that's that's the latter. Yeah, and I do think that um, I think that people that are capable of of taking responsibility to self custody, it's a it's a great thing for them, there are like a lot of benefits to it. But with that being said, there are trade-offs as well. And putting aside what an individual should do, I think that you have to look at, um, the reality is that most of the capital is stored in institutions and the concept of self-custody for institution, it doesn't really make sense anyway. It's frankly irrelevant. And what I mean by that is just take this kind of Wisconsin pension fund. Well, they bought this Bitcoin, but, and, and yeah, it's being held by Coinbase, but you know, via, via this ETF, so Coinbase, the custodian. But here's the thing. If you are a pensioner, if you're a client of this Wisconsin pension fund, you're not custodying the Bitcoin yourself, regardless. Like even if the Wisconsin, you know, the board of Wisconsin pension fund, they were the ones, you know, where we believe in self custody and we're going to set up a seven of 12 multi sig to custody the Bitcoin themselves. Well, that's cool. But the pe the people that actually have ownership of that Bitcoin, they're not cus they're not, they don't have self custody anyway. So there is no actual concept, you know, self custody is relevant for an individual, but once you go beyond an individual, it's, it doesn't really matter anyway. There's no, it's impossible to have a group of 50 people self, you know, or 10,000 people invest in a vehicle and have them all be self custodying. It's just not a concept that even makes sense or is even relevant. So I don't think it frankly matters like self custody for institutions. I don't see as an important issue. I do think I would like to see more custodians. Like I would love to see, I, I think it's great that Fidelity, uh, they custody it themselves. And I think that, you know, some other ETFs are using BitGo as a custodian. And I do think it's healthy to see a diverse pool of custodians because we don't want a situation where we're just using Coinbase's ledger to manage it, right? So I think that's a, that's a problem if it's everybody's using the same custodian. But I don't see really any issue at all with institutions custodying the, like, like the concept of Bitcoin banks or for institutional investment capital. I don't see any problem with that um, because fundamentally, it, 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 when it's this kind of pooled capital anyway, there is no, there is no uh, self custody. And it's, it, Bitcoin is serving a different purpose there. The purpose of Bitcoin for these kinds of investments, it's, it's the, it's not the freedom money aspect of it. It's, it's the investing attributes of it. It's the fact that, you know, it protects you from inflation. That's what, that's what matters. Not because you can take it cross border. That's not why a pension fund is investing in it. So that's where, that, that's kind of my view on it, really. Yeah, well, it's interesting when we look at, so you, so you see the danger of, of the honeypot in, in, in Coinbase. Uh, is, will that decentralize a little bit when pe people like, I feel like most of them did it because it was most like, more likely the, the SEC approves the ETF when they do it with Coinbase. I feel like that was kind of the story. Uh, do you think they, they will actually move to self-custody, like self-custody on an institutional level or to go with different providers? Yeah, I do think the uh, custodialship of it will diversify over time because it will be, get more competitive as an industry. Uh, but I, I, I think that the reason why Coinbase got all the clients is because they've already, like, this is a publicly traded company. They already are audited, regulated, everything about them is, you know, they've just done a lot of the work in advance to set up, to set up the, like the necessary 
uh, kind of protection you would require from an institutional grade custodian. So I think that's why they get they got all the clients. Um, but you know, yeah, I do think it would be better, like long term. I'd like to see more custodians and different. And I, I, I would hope that I do think it would be problematic if. And no, I, I don't at all foresee this world. But I, you know, we don't want to see a situation in which everybody, like all, all these kind of. S and P five hundred companies go. Yeah, we need a Bitcoin Treasury Reserve strategy, and they all use Coinbase as their custodian. I think, yeah, we, we, we want to see that diversify, of course, but I, I think that's going to happen anyway. Oh, yeah. Before we come to the end routine, uh, we talked a little bit about, about price targets. I read somewhere in in the research, I, I don't remember where, that you also have a price target in twenty thirty with three point five million. <laughs> Dude. Do you, do you, st uh, do you still have that or, or like, because you said like a price target is more like an indication how bullish you are, not like really that price target, that, that date. Yeah. Look, I, I, I don't have any kind of specific number I mean, it's 10, 10 years out. Not really. Um, I do think that you, you can kind of have, I, I think the, the way to kind of come up with these price targets is to use, um, a range of models and ideas, basically. Like, I, I, I like to look at a lot of models and kind of use that as a base idea. So, you know, people like, uh, for example, there's like, when I look at like the power law and the power law says Bitcoin will be a million dollars in 10 years. I'm not a power law maxi. I look at that and go, oh yeah, that like, that, you know, in, in my kind of, mental space of potential models, that's one model that has that at that valuation there. But I can also go, eh, maybe, maybe Bitcoin is just, you know, it's gold. It's just it's the gold. Okay, well, that, that if Bitcoin is just gold, what's gold going to be worth in 10 years? And Bitcoin kind of matches that. And how, do, how does that valuation look? And where does that play out? Or, how, you know, what's the total financial assets will there be in, in the entire world And how much of that will be Bitcoin? And that, that's another model. I, I try and use like a ton of different models, kind of, you know, in a bearish and bullish and a base case or whatever. But in any, in any kind of model that I would have for Bitcoin, I do think Bitcoin will be, you know, measuring it in, in dollars, but I think it will be seven figures in, 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 in a decade's time. The, whether it ends up being a million or 10 million, And then that's kind of like a lot of factors at play that kind of make that like very hard to predict. But honestly, once it gets to a point where it's such an obvious no brainer, like there's no, uh, there's nothing like it. that's sort of competing. It's the best asymmetric investment opportunity. So it doesn't really matter. You know what I mean? It just doesn't change your kind of decision tree at that point. If, if there was kind of, um, like something competing with Bitcoin that was like, oh, this thing could actually outperform. Well, that may, maybe then you have to like try and refine it, but it doesn't matter. I mean, if, 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 if it like, if, if Bitcoin is, if you told me Bitcoin is a million at the end of the decade, or you told me it's 5 million, I'm still going to put all my money in Bitcoin. <laughs> like what, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't matter. So eh, not too, not too worried about it. Uh, very cool. I have kind of like the, almost the same thing. Like, I, I, you, I, I never did a price prediction and I get that asked a lot in the DMs. Oh, what do you expect on a, on a base case, the Bitcoin average annual growth rate will be in the next 10 years. And I'm like, I don't even want to calculate that because like, why, what, what, what would I sell it for? Like, why should I spend my mental power in, in making all those predictions for the future? If, if I don't even consider not, not asset, if I consider other assets, then I have to look at it. Uh, but if I don't consider like it, it makes little to no sense. It's fun to do, uh, and it's entertaining to, to speak about. Um, and it, if, if you have the time and if you want to do it, like, uh, go for it. But uh, I find, I, I, I personally like don't find any, any value in that. Yeah. I, I think where the, the value would come if, if you were kind of modeling it and it was the question was, is Bitcoin going to do, you know, if you had a worldview where it was like, oh, I think Bitcoin is going to do CPI plus six or it's going to do CPI plus nine. If, if you were, the, if you're in that kind of world, then it's like important to model because that's kind of how you figure out 
what your allocation should be. But if you think it's going to do CPI plus 30 or CPI plus 60, it doesn't matter. Like you're going to invest in it anyway. So yeah, that's kind of how I look at it. Absolutely. And then uh, let's come closer to end routine. Uh, the question that I ask now every one of my guests is, uh, what are you currently passionate about besides Bitcoin? Like what are you learning, passionate about doing, uh, which has little to no, nothing to do with Bitcoin? Yeah, sure. Well, look, I mean, uh, well, I mean, I, oh, I, I have a, like, a strong passion for, I guess, fitness and lifting. And I, I mean, I, I always have, I think that's, that's like a really important part of my life. Um, setting up like working on for uh, starting a family right now. So trying to learn as much as I can about uh, being a parent <laughs> um, and, 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 and the, like this, this sort of thing. Um, I also just, um, I like to learn, learn new, new skills when it comes to uh, any, anything I can do really for, um, I guess, yeah, I, I, I like making videos or uh, I kind of like learning about like algorithms, like learning about how Google works and learning, learning about how X works and learning about this sort of thing. Um, really, you know, I will say, although it's Bitcoin and work is kind of all, um, I mean, this is, this is like what I'm already focused on, but I spend much of my life thinking about how we can kind of, uh, improve what we're doing. You know, we have a daily newsletter where we, where we focus on these Bitcoin flows and, you know, I want to make that like the best possible newsletter I possibly do. So that's kind of spent a lot of time just thinking about, thinking about that and, and, and ways we can, uh, you know, grow and, and also just make it the best possible product. So that's kind of where I spend the majority of my time. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating for me how many times family comes up in that question. When I ask Bitcoin, it's like uh, family is like, I think probably the most common answer. And uh, I'd love to love to see it, that family is a, a big thing for Bitcoin. Uh, let's come to the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who actually the next guest is. Uh, and this is an interesting one uh, that you got uh, f from the previous guest. How do you foresee the Bitcoin community influencing the upcoming presidential election? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, well, I mean, I think I think we're already we're already seeing it. I think that Trump Trump is pressured essentially to take a pro Bitcoin stance, and he's doing that, and I think that's fantastic for Bitcoin because you know up until twenty twenty four we haven't really had a a Bitcoin champion and. Uh, I would, I would hope to see, you know, in, in future elections, maybe both sides are uh, pro Bitcoin or it becomes an issue about who's more pro Bitcoin. Um, but certainly right now, at least it's kind of a wedge issue in, in this election where you're seeing one, one, one's taking the stance of being pro Bitcoin. And I do think it's going to have a big impact because, you know, we've seen Biden veto this this Bitcoin bill, which would have allowed banks to custody and lend against lend against Bitcoin. And if you're going to vote, if, if Bitcoin is an important issue for you, you can't vote for Biden. I mean, <laughs> I, I say that as someone's like, it, you know, if, if, if other things are important to you, OK, maybe you can. But if Bitcoin is your issue, then you can't vote for Biden uh, because he's patently terrible for Bitcoin relative to the alternative. So that's that's a clear as like they, he, they've sort of, that's a clear demarcation in terms of how it's going to line up for this election, I think. Yeah, I, I also think so. Like, uh, when, uh, but in general, like I, I, I saw the debate, unfortunately. <laughs> and, uh, I also saw that meme where they compared the Obama uh, presidential um, debate from 2012 with the one now. It was, it was very funny. Um, I just, I just, it's it's great that I'm in Europe and I don't have to vote in America. Uh, that, that's what I would say I would be would be hard for me. Uh, but uh, I, I definitely also feel like that if if you really if you're a single issue voter and I am one, um, you have to basically want vote for Trump now. Like Biden is definitely not the pro candidate. Uh, there, there might be Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, um, but then you also have to think like how 
how likely is it that he wins? <laughs> um, if you don't want to do the strategic uh, uh, voting, you just go with, with maybe with Robert Kennedy Jr. Um, but yeah, like I'm just glad that I don't have to do this. But I'm I'm still envy of America uh, because uh, in Europe there was also election. There was the EU election uh, and it was in complete EU. It was like beginning of June and there was no word of Bitcoin, not from any candidate. There was nothing. So in America, at least it's a, at least it's an, a topic. I, I could not even figure out who's the pro Bitcoin candidate in Austria for the EU election. I wrote all the papers uh, that they put out, all the things that they put out from every party. And we have in, in Austria five uh, that uh, come in and none of them even mention crypto or Bitcoin or anything like that. Uh, they mention inflation, but then they go ahead and talk about the war <laughs> yeah. and not about money debasement and not about central banking. So uh, I was kind of disappointed, honestly, because in America, at least it's a debate. At least they're speaking about it. At least there's one, two candidates they that they are forced to speak about it. It's they are, they are way. How is it actually? You're in Australia, right? How is it there? Yeah. Uh, no, it's, Australia is very similar to Europe. So I, I, I do think that America is. I agree with you. There's it's, it's at the cutting edge of uh, technology and Bitcoin uh, and freedom and all you know and has been has been it's leading and. You know, we can laugh at the fact that they've got two 80 year olds competing to be president, but uh, honestly, we have to be envious of a lot of what America has because there's a lot to be desired about. I mean, I think that it's clear that Bitcoin is a big issue for uh, in, in America in particular. And then they also, you know, America ha is leading the way on AI. And, you know, when you look at like Australia and Europe, you have to say, what are you guys doing? What, like, what are you doing? Because we, you know, we we don't have really anything. It's all coming out of uh, America, so we can, you know, laugh at the stupid stuff we see them do, and there's a lot of that too. But you know, when you look at the actually, um, if you want to be optimistic about the world and look at all the big important stuff that is also coming as good, it's not coming out of Europe. It's not coming out of Australia either. <laughs> uh, it's all coming out of America. So. Um, you know, you take the good with the bad. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, before we, before I let you go, um, where can people find you and, and ask questions and then find more about you? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm on X, Thomas underscore Farah, um, also co-founder of Apollo. So you, you can, uh, we have a daily newsletter that flows uh, focused on focused on all the Bitcoin flows, primarily looking at uh, a couple of these ETF flows and also just daily news. You know, really love anybody that hears this to subscribe and let me know what you think of that daily newsletter. And then, uh, yeah, you know, send me a DM on Twitter because I'm always happy to, it's, it's, it's great to talk to people interested in Bitcoin. Um, you know, always love that, meeting new people too. Perfect, then, yeah. Thank you, Tom. And for the rest uh, of Team Satoshi, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.